August 17th, that's a Wednesday night, 6 p.m. Come help. We need your help. We're going we're gonna to move. Right? God is doing great things. And I, I want you to know this morning, it's not the only thing that he's doing. I want you to know that it's just one step in a bigger journey that he has for us. So we are grateful. We are grateful for, for both landlords that have allowed us to rent. And we want to bless this house uh, as we leave it. But in order to accommodate for all the growth, it's time for us to go. Right? So now, if you've got your Bibles, let me read 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I'm going to start in verse 10. Okay? He says this, God has revealed it to us by his spirit. What's God revealed to us? Well, it's it's wisdom from the spirit. He's revealing it to us by the spirit. And he says, the Holy Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. We've not received the spirit, little s, spirit of the world, but the spirit or the Holy Spirit who's from God. That we may understand what God has freely given us, that being salvation. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught us by Holy Spirit. Expressing spiritual truth in spiritual words. For the man without the Holy Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Holy Holy Spirit for they are foolishness to him and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned for the spiritual man makes judgments about all things but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment here here Paul quotes for who has known the mind of Christ that we may instruct him but he closes this section with this right underline this verse but we have the what we have the what You and I have been given by Holy Spirit access to the mind of Christ. So this morning I want to talk about what it means to have the mind of Christ. Okay? Then I want to talk about, you're going to get a two for one today. Right? Then you're going to get a how to have the mind of Christ. Because it's not just enough to talk about what is the mind of Christ. That's value. There's value there. Amen? We got to know how to, how do we get, pastor, how do I tap into, how do I access the mind of Christ when I'm not in Sunday morning at church? Correct? That's value. There's wisdom there, right? All right, let's do this. Paul says it like this. Let me break it down. He says, the Spirit teaches us how to have God's thoughts knowing the mind of Christ. Having solutions that go beyond natural thought and understanding and provision. Okay? When, when Kate and I were getting ready, we felt stirred by the Holy Spirit to go on a three-week fast. Now, at the time, we were leading a Master's Commission internship ministry training program, or whatever you want to call it, okay? That's why we just called it Master's Commission. We were leading an MC intern team of, a, uh, of 16, which is pretty good, Okay? We were projected to be well over 25 coming into the the fall of that year. We had a youth ministry of over 120 kids. We had we had 12, 10. We say small groups. There was about 10 kids, 10 to 12 kids, plus a leader or a couple leaders, depending on who you got in the group. Amen. Right? All over the church. If there was a nook and cranny, we met. I had one group meet in the elevator. And I had one leader whose job was to hit one, and it would go down to one, and then turn around and hit three, and it would go back up to three, right? And they just did that. They, they met, they did their small group, they did their teaching and prayer time with that, and it was awesome. This is not the time to leave that, because it's really successful, and it's going really well. We felt the Holy Spirit stir our hearts, go on a three-week fast, We did that in obedience. We knew at the end of three weeks we were going to be leaving that place of success and coming coming into a different place in ministry. How many of you know those are not logical thoughts? Those are prayer, Holy Spirit-driven thoughts and moments that go beyond natural logic and reason. Natural logic and reason says, hey dude, stay. 
You're beloved. Everybody loves you. You got a youth ministry of over 120 kids. It's the second largest youth ministry in the state. Your master's commission is about to be the largest in the region. You're going to have over 25 or whatever it was. So we had the growth and we had the favor. No, oh, yeah. Except for God. Right? Do you, have you ever had some of those but God moments? Thoughts that go beyond what you see in the natural. Let me give you another example. When we were praying about what are we going to do with the hub? Because the hub is a huge part of the ministry that exists here at 970 Church. Where are we going to house them? Where are we going to put them? God already had an answer. And it, what, that was not the answer we were looking for. We asked Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what do you want to do? And here's what it required of us. It required of us to say, this is not my ministry. This is your ministry. What do you want to do with it? And he led on our heart. He just laid it right out and said, I want you to call Pastor Jason at Clifton Assembly. It doesn't make, now listen to me. It doesn't make sense for another church to take on another church's ministry. Does it? Just nod with me. No, Pastor, it doesn't. Because it doesn't. That's not how, listen to me, that's not how denominationalism, I'm, I know I'm, I'm getting into deeper things right now. That's not how it's supposed to work. Right? This tribe owns this ministry, does this thing. This tribe does this ministry and does this thing. This tribe does this ministry and does this thing. Hallelujah, we're not normal. <laughs> and you're going, that makes a lot of sense. I know, none of us are normal. We've never been normal. We've never done it the normal way. Why start now? <laughs> We've got a culture and a pattern of not normal. It seems to work. <laughs> so we called, the Holy Spirit told me to call. So, all right. Here's the thought process. Pastor Jason, he's over here at Clifton Assembly. He's about 200 yards from this building. If you've got a really good arm, you can probably throw a rock and hit his parking lot. Pastor Jason, I know this is crazy. We have the hub ministry. We feel God's moving us and doing some things differently. Is there any way you would, your board would consider hosting the hub and we'll pay you rent? We'll pay for the usage of your facilities and, and he almost laughed at me. And he goes, you know, I'll run it past my board. And I'll, I'll let you know what we think. And then, like, okay, you, you think in, in your mind, I know, or I'll, I'll thought, I thought in my mind, okay, I don't have anything else to sweeten this offer. I got, I got nothing else except a thought about a provision outside of the normal realm of logic and, right, logic at this point, I've just got faith and I'll command at this point a suggestion, not of my own, from Holy Spirit, do this. Okay. So a week goes by. He calls, I call him. We, we kind of play in phone tag for a second. Which if you've ever, like, if you've ever hung it, out, hung it all out there for the Lord to do and then you get caught up in phone tag, does that not drive you even more batty? Right? You know what I'm talking about? You're like, you're, now you're starting to get into the sin part of anxiousness and frustration. And, and so we were playing phone tag and I finally got him on the phone. And he goes, yeah, hey pastor, just want to let you know, I talked to our board. We've agreed to host the hub. Praise God. Right? And then it gets better. And if we're going to partner with you in this ministry and it's not going to cost 970 Church a thing because we're so poor. <laughs> we, <laughs> woo, thank you, Lord. <laughs> lead, Holy Spirit, lead. <laughs> and then he showed us where we were going to be. And they've opened up the first floor to uh, the kids at the hub. And that's, that, what that means is this. They have, they have a fellowship hall. They have a big giant meeting room. They have a way to partition off that meeting room. So for kids that need to play, they can play. For kids that need to do homework, we have homework time. And they gave us their kitchen. So we can feed them. Because how many of you know, you gotta, if you feed them, they'll come in the name of Jesus. 
Okay, so listen to me. I, I tell you all the story because that's a testimony. That, that belongs to the Lord. That's not anything 970 produced. That is God going, this, this is me. Watch what I have for you. And here's the thing. You have to get outside lot normal logic and thought in order for this to work. Amen? In other words, we cannot lean on our own understanding. I think that's in the Bible somewhere. If you're, if you're familiar with Proverbs, I've heard that preaches. We have to get outside of our, outside of our own understanding. We have to get outside of, can I say it like this? We have to get si- outside of ourselves. You, you have to. If you're going to follow Holy Spirit, in other words like this, you're going to follow God, it's going to not look like what you want it to look like. And, and we have to be okay with that. Because if you knew what it looked like and you knew what the next step was, it wouldn't be called faith anymore. But big, big moment this week was this. Lord, forgive us for where we've ever postured our hearts and our thoughts to ever not need you. Forget, I mean, seriously. You can do it right there in your seat. Forgive us. Forever having postured heart and thought or thought, feeling and emotion or action, whatever, whatever we did, forever thinking, I don't need you. I want us to think about all the ways God leads and directs his people supernaturally, which go beyond the natural, beyond, it goes beyond the natural, it has to go into supernatural, it, it goes beyond reason and logic. And I'm not telling you to check your intelligence at the door, I'm just simply saying there, there are going to be some things by faith that we're going to have to be obedient to that go beyond natural intelligence, logic, and reasoning, Amen. Let me give you an example. Go to 2 Kings chapter 4. Yes, I, I have this one right in there. I, I got this one in there correctly. 2 Kings chapter 4. Let me read to you 1 through 7. If you're familiar with this, it's the widow's oil. The wife of a man from the company of prophets cried out to Elijah, Your servant, my husband, is dead. That's bad. And he says, You know that he revered the Lord. But now the, his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have uh, in your house? And she says, your servant has nothing there at all except a little oil. Now, let's stop right here. Elisha is asking her, what do you have within your possession? What do you have in your house? And she goes, I have nothing except I have a little oil. Okay? Now, in those days, she could sell the oil, pay off the creditors, Okay, and we're going to watch God do that, just not in the same way, right? She doesn't have enough oil to sell. She's got a little bit of oil. Now, she could have told Elisha how much money or how much debt she owed. He could have asked her, how much do you owe? He could have prayed to the Lord and said, Father, I need a check for X amount of dollars to, to take care of her, right? Does that seem logical and reasonable to you? How many of you are like, yeah, sure, that'll work. If you're familiar with the story, none of those options came up. <laughs> Watch what Elisha says. Go around and ask your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside, shut the door behind you and your sons, Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. Is that logical? Is that even reasonable? Is that in the natural realm? What is Elisha prescribing to her? Some of you said it now. If you got it, say it out loud so everybody else can get it with you. What is, what is that? The abundance. the abundance. It's a provision. Elisha taps into the mind of Christ. And now we have a provision produced supernaturally. Who gets the glory? God. 
Not Elisha. Not, here's what I love about this. If we want to if, if we want to access the mind of Christ, we have to come, and this is not in the notes, this is like Holy Spirit doing things right now. You have to be willing to give up all the glory. It, it has to be said publicly. John did not think of the hub ministry going to Clifton Assembly. I didn't think of that. I'm more brought worry and fear to the Lord. Don't get holy now. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Pastor John just said it. Sometimes that's all you got. I just came to Father with all I had. Which is, what are we going to do with this? And do you know what I heard in response? I don't know. Sucks to be you. <laughs> You're, you're going, God would never say that. I know, then why do you think he says that? <laughs> he said, I'm so glad you asked. I have a thought about that. But before I give you this thought, I want you to realize it's not about you. And this ministry is not about 970 Church. Okay, Lord, you're right. It's not about 970 Church. Sometimes God will give you things and he'll give birth, use you to give birth to things that are bigger than you. Mm -hmm. And you have to be willing to let them go. Unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it cannot produce a harvest 30, 60, and 100 fold. Do you know what the widow does? <laughs> You're like, well, I don't know. She obeyed. She, she took that mind of Christ crazy outside the realm of normal logic and reasonable and went okay she bothered all of her neighbors for every jar she could muster and I often picture she had her sons help her do it and then she did what Elisha told her to do she shut the door because not every supernatural prophetic provision is to be publicized. There are some things God just wants to give you and trust you with until the time is right. So she went in she took her two boys. They took the little bit of an oil that they had. And they began. And I don't, listen to me. I wasn't there. I don't know how much faith she had. She had enough faith to be obedient. Can I just stop and tell you right now? Stop trying to measure your faith and compare it to somebody else. It don't work. That's called the sin of comparison. Get over it. This, this, two most spiritual things I can say right now. Stop it. If you want to make it scriptural, in the name of Jesus, stop it. <laughs> Quit it. Don't do that. If you got a prophetic word, if you got a, 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 a place of supernatural provision and you don't know how this is going to work, don't even tell me. Why? Because I didn't give it to you. Holy Spirit did. And if he gave it to you, it's your job to be obedient and let him provide. Because I'll be honest with you. People have brought me some of their crazy, illogical, unreasonable things. And I'm standing there just as dumbfounded as you are. 
Well, I don't know how that's going to work. Well, I know. I don't think I want to do it. No, 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 no. Don't include me in your disobedience. No. (laughs) I've had to learn, like, if it's crazy enough that the Holy Spirit and you put God on it, well, then he's got it then. Then stop telling me about it. I don't want to be accountable for it. (laughs) I want to know what the testimony is afterwards, right? She does it. When all the jars were full, she said to her sons, bring me another one. But the son replied, there's not a jar left. And then, watch, then the oil stopped flowing. And she went and she told Elisha, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts so that you and your sons can live on what's left. God's provision defies logic and reason. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all of our ways or paths, depending on what translation you have, acknowledge the Lord, right? The widow's supernatural solution would have never been received if she'd had a natural provision. We would never read about it if she'd had another way to come up with it. The reason we don't develop the mind of Christ is because we usually solve life's challenges with lower level natural thinking that might be based on biblical principles but not actually be spirit led. Listen to me. Up until a few years ago, the Supreme Court had the Ten Commandments posted. Like there are businesses that if you went and looked at their business model and you looked at how they handled their finances, you'll see biblical principles there. Correct? That's cool. There's some success in that. But you can have that success because you're following the, will, the, the word of the Lord, not because you're being spirit-led. So if we're going to be spirit-led, here's the thing. If we're going to access and have, have the mind of Christ, that, that includes living biblically and obeying Holy Spirit. Which means, in order for me to obey the Holy Spirit, I've got to first have a relationship with Holy Spirit. Oh. <laughs> Somebody went, oh. Okay, well, how do I do that? Well, let's, let's keep going. The only way to know what God is thinking is to have a connection through Holy Spirit. Turn with me to John chapter 5. I'm going to turn there too, so don't, we'll, we'll arrive there hopefully together. John, if, if you were with me in First, Second Kings, you're going to take a big right. Go to John, the book of John, Gospel of John. I'm in Luke. Keep going. How many of you are singing the song to yourself right now? You, how many of you even know what song I'm talking about? There, back in the ancient, in the ancient days of, of Sunday school, you remember Sunday school? They used to sing a song that taught us the books of the Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts and Romans and Corinthians. No, I'm going to stop there. I got enough of an earwig now. You're going for it. John chapter 5, verse 19. John chapter 5, 19. Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth. The son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son does also. Verse 20, for the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, to your amazement, he will show him even greater things than these. Ah! And you've been given the mind of Christ. Maybe I didn't say it right. Jesus is perfect example and standard of knowing and doing what Father is saying and doing. In other words, what Jesus is clarifying here is this. I don't do anything outside of what the Father has for me to do. Well, how do I do that? Go back and look at it. I'll tell you the truth. The Son can do nothing by himself, right? Right? So in other words, Jesus is already telling us the posture is, I don't do anything without dad. Right? Father, forgive us for where we've ever taken up a posture that says we don't need you. I don't do anything without dad. I only do what I see dad doing because whatever the dad does, I do also. 
Come on. For the Father loves the Son. There's relationship. And He shows Him, watch, shows Him all He does. Yes, to your amazement, Father will show Jesus even greater things than these. Right? Now, we like to posture ourselves in two places. We like to posture ourselves with, well, that's not reasonable, and that's outside the realm of normal. We would say, it's outside the realm of natural. That's why it's called supernatural. <laughs> Come on. It's not normal, it's not natural. You're right, it's supernatural. <laughs> Some of you are going, I don't know where he's going with this. Good. Jesus is perfect example. Jesus says, I don't see, I don't do anything, I don't say anything, and I don't, I don't see anything, do anything, or say anything outside of what the Father sees, does, and says to me do. That's from Alabama. Whatever I see Dad doing, that's what I'm doing. Whatever I hear Dad saying, that's what I'm saying. And at no point in time am I ever posturing myself that I don't need him. Come on. Jesus is perfect example and standard of knowing and doing what the Father is saying and doing. If you t keep going, let's go to John chapter 16 for just a second. This is Jesus after he's given them communion. I think it fits pretty well this morning, but I'm a little biased. John chapter 16, 13 through 15 says this. Jesus says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But verse 13, he says, but when he, the Holy Spirit or Spirit of truth comes... Holy Spirit, he will guide you into all truth. He, Holy Spirit, will not speak on his own. He will only speak what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. This is a phenomenal thought for a lot of believers. Holy Spirit, one part of the triune perichoresis pretzel, right, wants to communicate with you, making it a four-hold pretzel. He wants to include you in the plan God has for you to accomplish in Him. How many of you want to be the fourth wheel? You're going, wait a minute. You want to be the fourth hole in the pretzel. It's a three-leaf clover, and when you and I got saved, it miraculously and spiritually becomes a four-leaf clover, and you're the fourth leaf. And the other three leaves are in perfect union, edifying, submitting to one another, and the Lord says, and now you're the fourth part. We went from a three-wheeler to a four-wheeler. I don't know how many other ways I can communicate this to you this morning. <laughs> And he says, I want, listen, Holy Spirit wants to reveal to us. Do you understand? Do you un... You don't have to call the psychic network anymore. You don't have to read the tea leaves anymore. You could just drink the tea, right? You don't have to call some supernatural, spiritually person that you need on speed dial. What do you do? You go ask Holy Spirit. And then you wait. <laughs> you had me till there, Pastor. <laughs> you mean I got to wait on God? Listen. This church has been waiting for five years. I will tell you, when we first moved into this building, we were grateful to have this building. Because we unceremoniously were booted from the previous one. I'm just glad we didn't go three for three. Amen. We got booted from the first one too. Another story for another time. It was always moving in here with less than a year on the docket. And God had other plans. For five years, for five years, we have sat here and we have sought God's face. 
And we have come through a process where the most precious thing to this house is the presence of God. And we've seen miracles. I, I, there are too many to tell. We've seen miracles in the house. We've seen miracles outside the house. We've seen deaf ears opened. We've seen God recreate stuff. We've seen God's provision. And guess what? It was all outside of normal. It was all outside of natural. It was all outside of logic. It was all outside of reason. Uh, be careful, I'll preach something else. Jesus says the Holy Spirit wants to tell us what's to come by taking what, by taking what is his, by, by taking what is Holy Spirit's and making it known to us so that Holy Spirit gets the glory. Can I just say it like this? You've heard me talk about you're a conduit of grace. You're a conduit of provision. You're a conduit of the supernatural power that's mentioned in the name of Jesus. You are a conduit to his glory. In other words, the conduit does not get the credit, nor should we. The donkey just delivered the Savior. No one praised the donkey. Right? I like to say it like this because it just sounds a little bit more modern. We are deliverers of a really good pizza. It's a supernatural pizza. And the Lord likes to let us have a tip every now and then. Come on. But that's what we are. We're conduits of grace. We are conduits so that, so that what happens through us, he receives the glory for. Because we spent time in relationship with Holy Spirit to hear, see, know, seek what is God's will in this situation. What does God not know about? <laughs> He's omniscient. What does that mean? God is all-knowing. So I'm setting you up. What does he not know about? Nothing. Take these two fingers right here. He doesn't know about nothing. He knows about everything. Maybe you're facing financial crisis. What does God not know about money? Maybe you're facing a family crisis. What does God know not know about family? He's only got about seven and a half billion children. Whether they know it or not, that's a different story. What does God not know about healing? The Bible calls him the great physician. The Bible calls him heavenly father. What does God not know about? Nothing. Here's our issue. As long as we are posturing ourselves that we can solve life's problems with our, in our own natural ability and understanding, we are effectively and figuratively, we are tying God's hands around his back and saying, thank you, Lord. I know you probably got a provision, but I'm going to see to this one myself. I love you. You're dumb. <laughs> That's just dumb. Why would you tie the God of the universe, why would you figuratively tie his hands around his back and go, I got this one. When he's going, all right, all right okay. Hmm. How about... Hmm. Joshua chapter 6, 1 through 5. What does God not know about warfare? What does God not know about calling? What does God not know about taking an inheritance he's given you? Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. So in Jericho, no one, in, in, no one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. 
March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. And on the seventh day, march around the city seven times with priests blowing the trumpets. In verse 5, when you hear the sound of the long or the last blast of the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the walls of Jericho or the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up. Everyone straight in. This is accessing the mind of Christ because this is not how you go take the city of Jericho. This is supernatural beyond. How many of you know I need SEAL Team 6 and some Semtech and then I can probably take Jericho. <laughs> and God goes, no, 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 no. No, no, I want to establish you, Joshua, as their leader. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to have you and the priests and the worship team. I'm going to let the worship team go first. I don't, and the worship leader said, praise the Lord. <laughs> and I want you to march around the city one time a day for the first six days. <laughs> Would you want to be Joshua explaining that to your worship team? <laughs> I thought about that a lot this week. I thought, I'm going, to call, I'm going to call a private meeting with Don, and I'm going to go, hey, this is the worst place in all of the city, and you're going to lead worship around it. And Don's going to go, have you eaten pizza past 11 p.m. lately? <laughs> and you know what's going to have to happen? I'm going to have to go, Don, I cannot explain this. I just know that this is from the Lord. And we're going to be obedient to it. Oh, and about the seventh day? To see the first six days, that's just preliminary. On the seventh day, you've got to go around it seven times. So make sure you're in shape. <laughs> and, then, and then on the last time around, we're going to give a final horn blast. Okay, and then all the men are going to shout... And the Lord said, the walls will come down. And God said, that's how I want you to take Jericho. And Joshua went, oh, okay. Why? Because we're a conduit beyond reason, logic, normal, natural. What does God know about identity? What, what doesn't he know about identity? Josh, Judges chapter 6. If you're familiar with scripture, this is the story of Gideon. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak tree in Oprah. Ophrah? There we go. That belonged to, I always get those two confused. One leads a network. The other one's just a tree in a city. Belonged to Joash, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press trying to keep it from the Midianites. I love this. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, just stop right here, Dev. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Picture wine press. It's a giant hole in the ground. And there's Gideon hiding in it, trying to thresh wheat, which by the way, you have to have access to wind in order to correctly thresh wheat. This is, so he's even bad at farming. <laughs> and the Lord goes, hello, you horrible farmer. No, he says, hello, mighty warrior. And, and Gideon doesn't have a really nice response. He says, pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Stop right there. Gideon is questioning the Lord being with him. Have you ever been in this situation where the Lord's called you by an identity? And then you go, God, where are you? Where is your provision? Father, where is your healing? Where is your comfort? Where is deliverance? Where is this right now?
Gideon says, where are you, God? And he says this. The Lord turned to him and said, I want you to go in the strength that you have. And I want you to save Israel out of Midian's hands. Am I not sending you? <coughs> Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? For my clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I'm the least in my family. And he says, I will be with you. And you will strike down the Midianites and leave none alive. What does the Lord know about Gideon's identity? First off, you're not a very effective farmer. <laughs> you're, you're really bad at threshing wheat if you think that we do it in a cistern. Gideon is looking in that moment. He's the weakest in his family. His clan is the weakest in the tribe of Manasseh. And he says, God, you, you, you got to have better selection. And the Lord goes, no, I've called you a mighty warrior. And the thing that you're trying to do right now is just provide for you. And I've called you to provide for an entire nation. So I need you to get out of that wine press, kid. And you want to see what I did for the, the people of old? I'm going to do it through you. What doesn't he know about? What are we asking him about? I love the story of David. It's not in, this, it's, it's not in the notes this morning. I just David is coming off of a victory and he comes home and long story short, the Amalekites have taken their loot, their, their plunder, their provision, all that stuff, and they've also taken the families. And David is leading about 500 to 600 men right now who are just like what we would say barely saved. Okay? And David takes the only thing he can at that point, which is an ephod, which is a garment of the high priest. He takes it and he, he goes up on a quiet place by himself and he asks the Lord two really important questions. And before you get offended with the questions, I want you to know the second question is a really valuable question. The first question is this. Should we overtake or should we go on the quest to overtake the Amalekites and get our stuff back? Families, it's pretty important. It's a really important question. And God says, yes. Are you ready for the spiritual question? It's the second question. David asks, are we going to win? You go, that's not very spiritual. Oh, listen to me. Jesus didn't come to die on the cross to lose. Think about that for a minute. I believe he says about his children, you're the head and not the tail. David asked him the second question. Are we gonna are we gonna win? And God says, Yes. What does he not know about? How do you access the mind of Christ? That, I mean that's the question, right? It's all great to talk about it, preach about it, and all that kind of fun stuff, but how do we do this? You ready? Three quick ways. In no particular order. First one, you got to get alone with God. You and I have to get alone with God. Let me give you my examples. The widow was alone. She got alone with God. Joshua was alone when he got the instructions on how to take Jericho. Jesus spent time without his disciples, alone with his father. Gideon was alone in a wine press. You gotta get alone. That doesn't mean you, you don't value people. It doesn't mean that you don't have boundaries. You gotta get alone with God. Amen. What do you do while you're alone with God? Shut up. <laughs> That's not very spiritual. Oh no, 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 no. Listen. 
If, we're, if all we're doing is getting alone with God is giving him the grocery list and, and going, why? that's not relationship. Relationship is two ways. It's a give and a take. So I come to the Lord and first off, God, what do you want to do with me today? Careful, that's a loaded question. You've got to position ourselves. We have to position ourselves to ask God what he wants to do. How he wants to do what he wants to do. And then we've got to listen, which means this. Stop talking. And do what? Listen. If you're a parent, you know exactly what the word I just spoke. Stop. Listen. Well, I'm not very good at listening. Not to put a fine point on it, but that might be the problem. <laughs> if I'm just going to God with the grocery list and I'm not taking, taking the time to ask him what he's doing and then listening for the answer, then I've postured myself in a place where really I don't care what I bring before the Lord. I'm just checking it off the relationship box and then thinking that's relationship. You know, that's not relationship. Now I'm going to get deep. That's prostitution. You're just coming to God with your needs and hoping he'll meet your needs and then getting mad at him when he doesn't meet your needs. That's not relationship. Second thing, you got to get alone with God. You got to get real. You, you got to, we have to. Why? Because the Lord, God will not lead you from a false identity. So until you're real with yourself and real with Heavenly Father, you might be there a minute. Come on. I got to be real. The widow's reality was, I have creditors who have come to take my children. Do you know what she didn't do? She straight up owned where she was. Said, this is the reality of the situation. And without a provision, I'm going to lose my future. My boys are gone. They're going to be sold into slavery. And I'm going to be sold into slavery with them. And once you became a slave in that culture and in that context and mindset... There was, no re there was no reality of you being kept together as a family. You understand what I'm saying? Joshua's reality was this. Lord, if you're not with me and you don't give us, if you don't deliver Jericho to us, we will never take what you've given us. We will never inherit everything you had in, planned and intended for us to inherit. Gideon's reality is, Lord... I don't even know where you're at right now and I don't know what to do about the God of the past of my ancestors. I haven't seen you move. Do you know that was the cry of our hearts five and a half years ago? Most people don't know this about 970. So I, I share this with you just being transparent. We're not the biggest congregation in this valley. You're like, well, that I knew, Pastor. I didn't, okay. We were, we, were, we were not struggling. We were just at a, we were at a crossroads where I felt, okay, Lord, if you don't show up in power, I'm out. I'm leaving. I'll go be of a denomination that doesn't have to believe in the power and the move of the Holy Spirit, and I'll go teach there. And we'll just pack up and go. And we were, we were looking. We were done. And I, well, I say we... I mean, Kate and I. More me than her. Leave her alone. She, she didn't know I was there, but I was there. And I was crying out to the Lord. I was crying out. God, you've got to do something. You've got to... You, where, where, where was the supernatural power I saw as a kid? Those seeds that you planted inside of me, God, where's that? And when I got real with him, he gave me a real answer. Which was this. Oh, I'm going to show you some things. But it's going to cost you more of you than you didn't know you had to pay. And the question is, is will you surrender and pay that? 
I'm not saying that to you. I'm saying that's what he said to me. It would cost me more of me in order to live in that relationship with him. I'm all right with that price. Why? Because that's when all heaven broke out. And we've had a mentor in that, and, and you know him as Robbie Dawkins. He's a friend of this house, and he's helped bring us along as that's been our heart's cry and pursuit. But it didn't get real until we first got real. Maybe some of the things that you're not seeing breakthrough in is because you're still approaching the Lord with a mask on your face. Oh, he's preaching now. <laughs> Don't worry, all my toes are broke too. <laughs> the widow was real. Joshua was real. Jesus was real. And it was really ugly in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was asking Heavenly Father, Lord, if there is any other way than this one. Gideon was real. Real with what? They were real with the good, the bad, and the ugly. I got five minutes. We had to get alone with God. We got to get real with God. And then finally, here's this. We got to decide to be obedient. And you go, wait a minute. It's a decision. It's a conscious decision to be obedient to what the, what the Lord's telling you to do. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to insult you, okay? I'm just telling you, yes. I don't, I'm not going to say this is in Scripture, but I'm going to suggest to you that maybe one of the reasons why you haven't heard from God is because if He gave you what He wanted you to do, you're now held accountable to not being obedient to it. I want you to examine your heart. Because here's the thing. Following the Lord is not the safest place you'll ever be. Now, he's good. And he has never described as safe. And if you've believed and bought into a Christianity that says the safest place you'll be is in the will of God, I'm sorry. Let's pull the bait and switch now. That's just not true. Is he good? Yes. Does he lead us into good and green pastures? Yes. Does he restore soul? Yes. Does he anoint us my head with oil? Yes. And then it says this, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he will deliver, no. He will pull me out of, no. What does it say? You are with me. That's Psalm 23. Thy rod and thy staff that comfort me. Mm -hmm. Let me close for like the third time. I want you to bow your head. I want you to close your eyes. Jesus, you gave us access through a covenant you established at Calvary to have the mind of Christ means I have to surrender me in order to take hold of you. I have to lay me down. I have to not lean on my own understanding. I have to realize that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. It doesn't mean I don't walk through it. It means I'm not alone. I just think of that song that says, I surrender all. 
I surrender my understanding. I, sur- I surrender my degrees. I surrender my experiences. I surrender my expertise. I surrender my anxiety. I surrender my fear. I surrender my frustration. I surrender my right to know and understand and think everything is going to just magically work out to the way that I think it should work out. Because Lord, you are with me. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would seal those three things to get alone, to get real, and to get obedient with you on our hearts this morning. Lord, forgive us for where we haven't gotten alone. Forgive us for where we've been too busy. Forgive us for where we've had too much going on. Forgive us for ever having a posture and a mentality and a mindset that says, we've got it all figured out, God, I don't need you. Forgive us right now in the name of Jesus. We just bring that stuff to you right now. Father, forgive us for where we've not been real for where we've been dealing with you from a false identity, for where we've been dealing with you from a fake mindset, for where we've been dealing with you, Lord, from, a, uh, from where we've had a mask on our heads and on our hearts. Yes, yes, we justify it and say, you're omniscient and you know it all. That doesn't excuse it. And we ask for your forgiveness right now in the name of Jesus. You have never been anything but genuine. You have never been anything but good. Father, forgive us for where, when you've told us stuff, we haven't been obedient. Forgive us, Lord, for where we've shied away from truth. Forgive us, Lord, for where we haven't followed exactly what you've been putting and telling us to do from your heart and from your word. We declare this morning that our heart's desire is to operate spirit-led mind of Christ, obedient to the King of kings and Lord of lords, led by and submitted to Holy Spirit. Our heart's desire, Lord, is to live in perfect unity with you. We acknowledge, Father, that for everything where we failed you, we bring it before you. And we ask for your forgiveness. It it is beyond logic. It is beyond reason. It is beyond natural. That's why you called it supernatural. It is not knowing what the next step is. That's why you call it faith. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in, through, and with the body of Christ at 970 Church and everything that's happening across this valley. In the name of Jesus, we pray. We bless, amen.